looking at the map of the game Seven Ages, one sees that it's a fairly standard world map. It has a globular tilt, which is nice, so that the north can meet together around this ice icy patch of the North Pole. Um, but it has its it's a standard kind of um, area area-based strategic map with different terrains, uh, tundra and or tundra and steppes, uh, forests, mountains, fertile zones, deserts. And there are, there are a few icons on the map as well. Uh, primarily these two here, oil and wheat, which are the two resource icons on the map. The only other icon on the map I think is um, very instructive uh, when it comes to understanding this game, and that is the elephant. Seven Ages is a game that spans through a time, a recorded history, I think, um, where players uh, get to get a certain number of empires that they can start and, and, and run at at any given time. And each of those empires has a different sort of way that they get points. And so players are going to be simultaneously often running multiple empires and um, expanding and improving their economic structure and fighting each other. Uh, they have different units for doing this. Uh, most of the units they can just get through getting progress levels, you know, advancing uh, through time, except for the elephant. To get an elephant, uh, you have to have the you have to have um, settled in the place where the elephant is from, and also be at the particular place on the uh, progress track here. The game is designed to flow pretty pretty easily and be simple to learn and teach, but there are actually a lot of rules uh, for the elephant. So if the game's center is the broad body of the elephant, the rules involving elephants is a, is a wayward trunk or a tusk. Seven Ages is an elephant. It has a large map. If you look at my tape measure here, it's all the way to 72, and it's not even the whole table. And this is all pretty squashed together. Not only are elephants the largest living land animal, but they also live a long time. Uh, so too can seven ages last a long time. But like an elephant that dies uh, shortly after birth, seven ages can also end early. According to the rule book, it can last about seven minutes, uh, depending on what happens. The game could last one turn, it's possible, especially if you're not playing the total history rules, which I would recommend the total history rules. And really, if you're sitting down for seven ages, you're going to assume that it's going to take a long time, so if the game did end early, you would probably uh, restart. Gameplay is rather simple and straightforward with some, with some bits of heavy depth and some odd offshoots. Um, it's a simultaneous action selection game, so you'll, each, each player will have these different um, things with the different actions, and then the actions come up on the sequence of play. So most of play is related to the different actions you're going to do, and then the different cards you have. Each card has three main parts. It has a empire part, which is the empire you're going to start if you play that as an empire. It has this band here, which is a certain uh, artifact or yeah that you can do, and then it has an event. Now the events really um, are a very elephant-like effect on the game. Um, you know, the empires would be maybe the body of the elephant, uh, but then the events are these, these crazy things that throw the game off of its historicity in some ways, but are also necessary to keep empires from flourishing forever, because an elephant always dies. These events, along with the, the staggered sequence of play, keep everyone involved the whole time because you can play an event on someone else's turn depending on what it says. So the game keeps you at the table despite its length. You can't really go off and do something else while it's someone else's turn because the turns aren't these big blocks. It's staggered and you also have these interrupt type powers that you get to do. Um, it's, it's, uh, Seven Ages is very much like that uh, elephant with the blind men. Um, it's, it's very historical because an elephant never forgets. You know, it has these, it, it, there's definitely been some research into the different, um, the different civilizations and whatnot. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's almost got a theological kind of perspective where, which I think a lot of games kind of do have this similar perspective where there's this, there's this odd connection between the different empires and that connection is the, the player. So the events, uh, many of them are actually conceivable things like volcanic eruptions or 
you know, um, and they're kind of deus ex machina events that you do. Um, but then some of them are just kind of referring to the player, like uh, itself. So it's it's almost like this the supernatural force is manipulating the empires and and creating this connection between disparate empires that are both being run by the same player. For example, there's one um, one card that's called Oi, it's my go, and it's just one of the players just like interrupting another player. It's not even related to the map in any sort of way or to the empires. It's something that's, that's just happening um, ex extraterrestrial, supernaturally, uh, behind the scenes. So the events really do run the gamut. Uh, over here we have these kind of uh, religious kind of you know, supernatural, the gods get involved cards, and there's really no explanation in the historical sense other than the gods just got involved. Then we have these weird time cards here where time warps and it kind of, you know, makes sense with the context of the game because it does span all this time and um, civilizations can arise uh, during uh, ahistoric time periods, though really, you know, they're, they're limited. Uh, to when they can come up. And then you have the, the kind of things that you might see in a, a, a CDG war game. You know, you have Alpine training, industrial espionage, and then Uprising. Uprising is a card where, um, you know, a, a certain number of, of areas in an empire space can just fight itself. You know, you have to divide it into two, and then one side fights the other, and that can really decimate an empire. Um, and cards like that really help to shorten the lifespan of an empire. It's, it's hard for like a Rome to last for a really long time because there's all these events that can really shatter it. And it's, you know, since ultimately you're going for your own points on, or glory in this case on this track, it may be better to let an empire go. And really when you step back, that's kind of what's pleasurable about the game to me is to see all these empires grow and shrink and disappear, and it would be a really fun game to watch time lapse. Uh, it would take a lot of videotape, however, or I guess not videotape, we're, we don't use that anymore. It would take a lot of digital memory storage bits. It's fun for me to play Seven Ages. It's an enjoyable, if argumentative, trip to the graveyard. You can't get too attached to what what you've lost. When a volcano blows up your capital uh, of one of your most favorite empires, it may be just time to say goodbye and, and remember the good things. Uh, it has some interesting um, ways of using points to uh, prompt certain behaviors, similar to games like Chariot Lords or Britannia, uh, which, I, which I would like to see in more games, actually, and maybe games that are outside of the sort of spanning empire genre. It'd be interesting like in a, in like a game about high school, for example, where uh, you, you know, just using points to, to prompt different sorts of behaviors, I think, could be moved to other settings. Uh, but I digress. It's a ponderous game about size and scope, about um, uh, simplicity and, and weight, and uh, interesting tangents. Some of them seeming superfluous. It's a game that stands astride uh, multiple forms, uh, structurally ponderous, perhaps. Uh, audacious, uh, designed for everybody, but not for everybody. Seven ages.